Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. God, we're so thankful for the presence of Jesus. Lord, you promise in your word that when two or three are gathered together in your name, that you are in the midst of us. And Lord, there's more than two or three of us in this place today. We acknowledge your presence. And Lord, we thank you for revealing yourself through the word this morning. Lord, we do not treat this time together as mundane. Lord, help us to engage our spirit, soul, and body in what you have for us this morning. Lord, we thank you that this is a sacred and holy time, and we treat it as such, Lord. We thank you that the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. We give you honor and glory this morning in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Yes, like Pastor said, he received a word, and then the Holy Spirit was, yeah, I just sensed him downloading some things in my heart. So that's what we're going to do today, is we're going to go ahead and discuss the things that the Holy Spirit had on his mind. Amen? So go ahead and get your Bibles out. Get your Bibles out. And turn to Psalm 81. And while you are turning to Psalms, let me do this. Um, for the last couple of weeks, the Holy Spirit has had this church on a pretty steady meal plan where the main course has been repentance, right? And we've been talking about repentance and what that actually means and what that looks like. Because kind of the understanding of repentance, it, it comes with a mixed bag. And a lot of people think that repentance means feeling bad about your sin. It means um, just saying, sorry, Lord. Uh, maybe ha had this thought of, well, I can ask forgiveness for it later. Right? Am I the only one in this place that ever thought, well, I can always ask God for forgiveness. <laughs> okay, that's not, that's not repentance. All right? Or it's th maybe thinking that you have to pay penance, that you need to be punished for your sin. And that's not repentance either. In the, in the Greek, which is what the New Testament is written in, the word that we've translated repentance is actually the word metanoia, which is two words combined, and it means to change your mind. That's all that it means, is to change your mind, to change direction, to go in a different direction, to course correct. And I love that line of thinking because I'm someone that loves GPS. I am so thankful for GPS. GPS has saved my husband and I many, many, many arguments. Going through Dallas, right? I'm of an age where I remember our family road trips being a little kid, and my parents had that giant paper map. Remember that huge thing? And it would like unfold, and it would like take up the front mirror or the front window and the whole thing. And you'd have to, you'd have to highlight the path that you were going to take, right? So then there were countless discussions about how the map got refolded. <laughs> my dad was always he wanted it to look just like the way that it came from the store and my mom was like who cares it's folded <laughs> and then I am of an age where when I was beginning to drive we had MapQuest and you had to print out like 14 pages your document and staple it together and you're trying to navigate and read this like document that you're flipping the pages right but now we have GPS Thank you, Lord, for GPS, because when I miss an exit in Dallas, all it says is recalculating. It says recalculating, right? It doesn't get upset. It's not mad. It just says recalculating, and it finds me the route where I need to get back to where I'm supposed to be, right? Can you imagine trying to navigate Dallas or Houston without GPS, without a map, without instructions? Can you imagine how frustrating that would be? The Holy Spirit is our guide in this life. God did not leave us in this earth to navigate his plan and his will without a guide. So when the Holy Spirit gives us instructions and he says, hey, recalculating, that means we've gotten off the path. We've gotten off and we need to get back on. And that's all that repentance is. Because we don't think like God thinks, right? When we get saved, our spirit man becomes new. 
It becomes alive to Christ. But our soul, which is our, our mind, our will, and our emotions, they're still of this world. So we think the way the world thinks about everything. So our job when we get saved is now to transform our thoughts and our mind by renewing it to the Word of God, beginning to think like God thinks. And you know what that is? Repentance. It's repentance. It's course correcting and getting back off of the wrong thinking and then beginning to make adjustments and think the way that God thinks. All right? So as we talk about the things that the Holy Spirit, I I picked up from the Holy Spirit, as we talk about these things, I'm going to talk about them as places we need to course correct. That there are four things that the Lord spoke for this church. It applies to everyone. But for this church, there are four things that God wants us to make some course correction on. And listen, Romans tells us that it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. God is not mad or upset. Just like the GPS, when it gets a, when you, you know, you totally miss your turn, it's not yelling at you. Your spouse might be. <laughs> but the GPS just says recalculating right? God is not mad or upset. It is God's goodness and his kindness that he says, hey, course correct, recalculating. Let's get back where we need to be. Amen? Amen. So in Psalms 81, we're going to read, we're starting at verse 8. Listen to me, O my people, while I give you stern warnings. Isn't that encouraging? (laughs) Isn't that a wonderful way to start church this morning? (laughs) Oh, Israel, if you would only listen to me, you must never have a foreign God. You must not bow down before a false God. For it was I, the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it with good things. But no, my people wouldn't listen. Israel did not want me around. So I let them follow their own stubborn desires, living according to their own ideas. Oh, that my people would listen to me. Oh, that Israel would follow me walking in my paths. I encourage you to continue reading that on your own time, but for the sake of time today, we're going to stop there. Every time I read the account in the Old Testament of the people of Israel, I'm reminded how we have not changed. We have not changed. And I love this line where he says, oh, that my people would listen to me, that they would follow me walking in my paths. God's heart for you is that you would know him and you would love him and you would follow him. That is God's will and it's his desire for you. So the first path that we need to make some course correction on is seeing God as a spiritual Santa. And I'm, I'm going to explain what that means. Okay? Come Thanksgiving time, parents that have young children who do Santa at their house, what do they start saying? You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming. Right? Santa Claus is coming. You better be good. If you want presents under the tree, you better be good. So those four weeks, the kids shape up. Forget about the other 11 months. You know, forget about those other 11 months. The, the, the four weeks leading up to Christmas, the kids know how to behave and be good for Santa so that they can get the presents under their tree. Then once December 25th is over, forget about Santa, right? And what I'm trying to tie this into is that this kind of thinking, we can get stuck thinking about God in the same manner. And usually when we see this line of thinking is when people go through difficult seasons, when they go through difficult times, when life throws them major curveballs, and then they realize, oh, God, I haven't been praying much. I haven't been going to church much. I haven't been reading my Bible, so I better be good. I better be good so that I can get out of this season. I need God's help. And the course correction God wants us to make is God wants 
you to know him. I had an uncle that was, he was old when I was little. He was in his 80s and 90s, and he had made some wise choices when he was younger with his money. So by the time he was an older gentleman, he had lots of money. And people would come into his life, and they would spend time with him, and they would buddy up to him, and then they would ask for money. And he was sweet, and he was gentle, and and he was very giving. And he would give it to them. And what did those people do? Disappear until they need more money. Now, we recognize this as toxic, unhealthy behavior, right? And yet, some of us need to recognize that we treat God the same way. That we are looking to God to give us something, but not to know him. We want God to give us blessings, but we don't want to know him. God's desire is that you would know him and love him for who he is, not what he can give you. God is so wonderful and generous that, yes, he will bless you. But his desire is for you to know him. That's the whole reason he sent Jesus. The veil is torn. There is no longer anything between us and God. It says that we can come directly into his presence. And on top of that, he gives us his Holy Spirit on the inside of us to teach us God's voice, to show us his ways, to help us to obey his will. Amen? It is unhealthy behavior for Christians to use God like Santa. God wants to be known by you. So some of us need to make course correction. I'm not picking up anybody specifically on any of these, just to clarify. God knows your business. I do not. Okay? So we know how to behave for two hours on a Sunday morning. (laughs) We know how to put on a really good church face for two hours on a Sunday morning. But God knows what's going on in your heart. God knows what's going on on the inside And if you need to make course correction and stop putting God on a shelf when everything is going good, and then when things aren't going good anymore, you're like, oh, yeah, I guess I better be reading my Bible and spending time in prayer and coming back to church and getting involved in a small group. Because we do those things not so God will bless us. We do those things because we love him. Right? We do those things because we love him. And it honors him when we do them. Amen? Amen. Go in your Bibles to the next scripture, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. God is so good to us, and he loves us so much. And I'm going to read, I think I put 17 up there, but I'm going to start at verse 13, and then I'm going to read 17. It says, Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Verse 17, put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. All right. So the word of God, the sword of the spirit to battle against the enemy. Check. Let's go to Hebrews 4, 12. Many of you can probably quote this, but we're going to turn there together. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Okay, so we just covered what the word of God was given for. It is a weapon, right? These two scriptures refer to it as a weapon against the enemy. And what else? Yep, we heard it said one side, that two-edged sword, one side is for the devil to cut down the devil. The other is to cut you between soul and spirit. And here is why. The course correction that we need to make is that there's this line of thinking that has crept into the church that we are using the word of God to stay comfortable. We are using it as a weapon, not against the enemy, not against our flesh,
but so that we can stay comfortable. It's really quiet in this church this morning. And let me, let me kind of explain what I mean, okay? Go with me to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to go all over the Bible today. Matthew chapter 4. And while you're turning there, I'm going to tell you what's happening in Matthew chapter 3. John the Baptist is baptizing people in the Jordan River. Jesus comes to be baptized. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove, settles on Jesus. A voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Verifies that this is God's son. Jesus' ministry begins. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And you're thinking, oh, that, that's Jesus. Okay, for the sake of time, I'm not going to take you to all of them, but I'm going to give you some of the accounts from the Old Testament and New Testament. Moses thinks he's doing this really good thing, kills an Egyptian, finds out it's not a good thing, is now a wanted criminal. He goes and hides in the desert, but he's living his best life in the desert, right? He's got a wife, he's got a kid, he's a shepherd. But then the Lord comes to him and says, hey, guess what? You got to go back to Egypt. And then you have to tell the most powerful person in the known world at that time that he has to let the slaves go. You think that was comfortable? I don't think so either. Joshua was led... First place he's got to go as the leader. Where? Jericho. The walls of Jericho. There's no way to get through the walls. God led him right to an impossible situation. David, led by the Spirit of God to fight Goliath. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were led to stand when everyone else bowed, even facing death. Daniel was led to pray where people could see him even facing death. New Testament, the disciples were led to go across the lake twice, and God knew there'd be storms, and he still led them to the lake to go across. Paul led to towns where he was beaten, where there was stonings, and where he was imprisoned, all led by the Spirit of God. And if you're thinking, well, that's just for Bible people, that's not why I brought these, these accounts up. The reason I brought them up is because this reveals something about God's character. God is going to ask us to do things that are going to not be comfortable to our flesh. They are going to be very uncomfortable to our flesh. And what I mean by flesh is your mind, your will, your emotions. It is going to be very uncomfortable and unfortunately, the course correction that needs to take place is because we are concerned more about paying our Netflix bill than we are about making sure that the homeless are getting their needs met. Okay? And I'm, this is not in judgment because I have been on this and the Lord has asked me to course correct on this one big time. We are not to use the, the weapon of the word, making our confession so that we never have to go through a hard time. That's completely opposite to what is going on in the Bible. The destiny that God has for you is so much bigger than you. So it is going to challenge your flesh like crazy. And if you are always spending your time praying away hard seasons, guess what? You will stay the same. You will not grow into the person that God has destined you to be because the person that you are destined to be has to go through times where they learn to trust in God rather than themselves. Amen? That's what the word is for. That's why it says the word of God is given to divide between soul and spirit. God's way versus my way. Amen? Amen. A couple of weeks ago, Freddie and I... We have been in some, it's been a rough season. In the fall, Freddie lost his job that he had for almost 15 years. And it kind of turned everything upside down. And everything is still kind of crazy. And uh, I said to Freddie, 
I just wish this season would be over. And as soon as I said it, in my spirit, I heard, but I have so much to teach you in this season. And I knew that I knew that I knew that what I'm learning in this season is absolutely vital for what my future holds. So I don't need to be spending all of my time trying to pray away the uncomfortable things. I need to be leaning into the Lord and let him teach me what I need to learn in difficult seasons. We need to quit running from difficulties. We have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, church. We should be the ones people are looking to and saying, my goodness, what, it is, what is it that you have where you can face such difficult circumstances? Because we have the Spirit of God, we should not be trying to run and hide from the devil. We should not be trying to run and hide from our destiny. Amen? Amen. So course correct, if that's you, God's going to challenge your flesh, and we got to be okay with that. Amen? All right, James chapter 4, verse 10. James chapter 4. In verse 10, it says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. I'm not going to get into a lot of what humble means, but humble yourself before the Lord. Let's just be real. Every single thing that we have, we have it because God is good. Everything. I'm talking about not just our, our possessions, your brain, your mind, your ability to do things. Every single thing that you have is because God is good and he is kind and gracious. And so when we humble ourselves before the Lord, it says that he is the one that gives the honor. So the course correction that I heard that we need to do here is that some of us, we are desiring to be seen as a spiritual authority, desiring to be seen as spiritual. And you might think, well, that's not a bad thing, but... It's not a bad thing, except when the desire is for you to be seen. Our goal in life is not to be seen and validated by people. Whatever anointing God has put on your life, whatever plan and purpose God has for you, whatever gifts he has given you, talents he has given you, those are not to draw men to you. Those were given to draw people to God. And we must, church, precious church people, understand that we are not beyond the sin of pride. We are not beyond the sin of pride. We have a propensity to get sucked right into it. And let me tell you, here, here are a couple of things. I need you to listen, because some people are starting to fall asleep. But this is really important. This is really important. If you are desiring to be seen and validated as anointed, if you're desiring to be seen and validated for your gifts, it doesn't mean that you don't have them. That's not what I'm saying. It means that you need somebody to recognize them, speak them out, praise you for them for your spiritual knowledge and understanding. Then the Lord gave me a couple other things. If you are giving spiritual advice to people that you've heard this spiritual advice and it's good, but you haven't backed it up with your life, this is a form of spiritual pride. And the Lord is so kind and gracious because it says pride comes before a fall. So he is kind and he's saying we need to make correction. If you have not lived it, you need to take the time to live it. And then you can preach it. Because then it has authority because you've actually done it and you believe it. And it has power in it. Rather than you just parroting words that you've heard. Another one is feeling the need to correct people so that you can be right. You, it's almost like you cannot let people be wrong spiritually. This is a form of spiritual pride. Let people be wrong. I got, a, I got a good news for you. We don't need another Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is really good at his job. He is so good at his job. He does not need us to do it for him. Amen. He knows all, sees all. He knows how to reach people. When we think we have to help the Holy Spirit by correcting other people and we haven't been given instruction to do it, we are actually harming those people and their relationship with the Lord. And we must be very careful. Jesus said, I only say and do what I hear my Father to say and do. We must be very careful that we do not have the urge to correct people when they're wrong. Let them be wrong. God's good at his job. He can take care of it. He can take care of people. Amen? Amen. And I can, I, I can almost feel some people saying, yeah, but that's the ministry he gave me. No, it's not. No, it's not. It is not the ministry he gave you. Because you know what? Correction can be received when it comes through relationship. If you do not have relationship with people and you're trying to give them correction, it's not going to be received unless the Spirit of God is on it. Then he paves the way. Otherwise, it's just you in your own power trying to make things happen. Okay? Maybe you feel the need to impress people with your knowledge of the word. You feel the need to impress people with the gifts that you operate in or the anointing that you have. Or the expectation to preach and teach from a pulpit. I'll just let that sit for just a second. There are places where you can preach and teach. If that is what the Lord has put on your heart, you do not need to stand behind a pulpit to minister the word of God. You do not need a pulpit. The church, sometimes we have people, we've had people leave this church because their ministry wasn't used and their gifts weren't used in the way that they wanted them to be used. We must be very wary, church. Spiritual pride loves to creep in. It loves to sneak in. And the last one is when we think we know it already. When, when someone is up here ministering and they're teaching on a topic that you've heard one, two, three, four, ten, twenty times before, and you think, I already know this, that is spiritual pride. We can read this from cover to cover a thousand times and still get something new every single day we read it. Every single day we read it, we can get something new because there is never an end to God's knowledge and understanding. Never an end. So when we think we know it all, that should be the biggest red flag ever because we absolutely do not know it all. Amen? Amen. Last one. Last one. We're just about done here. Course correct. Psalm 119, 105. This is one of my favorite scriptures. Psalm 119, 105. It says, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. God's plan for you is to follow him. Wow, that was some major revelation in here. (laughs) God's plan for you is to follow him. Not for you to lead. It is for you to follow him. It says his word is a light to your feet and a lamp to your path. Anybody ever been camping and you got to have the flashlight? That flashlight isn't illuminating the whole world. That flashlight is only illuminating the next few steps in front of you. God does this on purpose. God does not give you point A to point Z and every step in between. God gives you, we are starting here, and I'm going to give you one step, two step. And then you're going to take it. And the more that you walk, the more the path is illuminated, one, two steps at a time. The course correction that we picked up in prayer 
is that some people are having trouble trusting in God because they want it all illuminated. They don't want steps one and two because that's the unseen out there is too scary. They want steps one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. They want all of them. But here's the thing. God wants us to follow him and trust him. You think if God gave you all the steps that you would follow his lead? Come on, we know, we know ourselves. We know ourselves. The problem is, is that we want control, not faith. We want to have control over God's plan for our life, not have faith in him to lead us. So course correction is needed. You can trust God. And if you're having trouble trusting him, you need to spend more time with him. Because God is good, and you can trust him with your future. You can trust him with the next 10 steps, even if you can't see him. But you have to take the steps of faith and follow after him. You cannot stand there and wait and demand the Lord to give you all of the steps. You just stay in the same place. God is calling you today to make the course correction necessary. Trust in him. He's got you. He's got you and he's got your life is in his hands and he knows how to do his job. Can you imagine if we tried to be God? Oh my gosh. We already, we mess up our own lives enough. Can you imagine if we, oh. God is so good at what he does and he loves you with an everlasting love. So when he gives us adjustments that we need to make, let us, church, make the adjustments. Let us adjust the things where we have gotten off on the wrong path, whether it be that we've been using God to get things from him, rather than building relationship, whether it be that we are trying to avoid growing, we're using the word to avoid difficult circumstances rather than growing, whether it's form of spiritual pride that we've been operating in, or whether it's our lack of trust in him. All we have to do is get back on the path, is make the adjustment, repent is what the Bible is talking about, Change your mind. Change directions. Realize that the path you're on is not leading you closer to the Lord. So it's time to get back on the path, recalculating and course correct. Amen? Go ahead and stand. We're going to pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I just did. Number one. Pastor wants me to go review. Number one. The path that, the course correction is spiritual Santa, treating God like a a vending machine rather than having relationship with him. Number two, using the word to stay comfortable and to stay out of difficult circumstances. Number three, a desire to be seen as spiritual, as anointed, desire to be used in a way that you want to be used. And number four, a lack of trust and you just want control and not faith. So Lord, right now, if any of those things, Lord, If we are on any one of those paths this morning, we make the necessary adjustments right now. We repent, Lord. We repent of using you like Santa, of trying to be good so that you will bless us rather than spending our time getting to know you. Lord, help us to get to know you. Help us to love you the way that you deserve to be loved. Lord, forgive us. For using the word of God and trying to make confessions and prayers to stay out of difficult circumstances. When, Lord, you are calling us to a place that is stretching us and growing us and challenging our flesh. Yes, we know that there is an enemy in the earth. But the, the Bible says greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Thank you, Lord, for helping us. 
to begin to use the word as it was intended to take back the kingdom of uh, to take back against the kingdom of darkness the territory that belongs to the people of God and help us to use it to divide between soul and spirit your will not our will be done in the name of Jesus and Lord forgive us for getting into spiritual pride Forgive us for thinking we know it all. Forgive us for thinking it's our job to be the Holy Spirit. Forgive us for thinking we must be validated, that we need to be needed by people. Forgive us, Lord. Lord, you are good at your job. And so we yield that to you this morning. We make the necessary heart adjustments that you, God, It says, when we humble ourselves before you, you will give honor. Oh, Lord, that we would desire to be honored by the Lord and not honored by man. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, lastly, forgive us for our lack of trust in you. Forgive us for not trusting in the one who has always been faithful. Forgive us for not putting our faith in the one who gave it all for us. We commit today to trusting in you in the steps that you lead us. And we yield the need for control. We lay it down at the feet of Jesus. You, God, you hold our future in your hands. And we can trust you. We thank you, Lord, so much for your goodness that draws us to repentance. Lord, we desire to think the way that you think, to do life the way that you would do life. Help us to renew our mind this morning to the word of God, that we may walk close with you, Lord, that we may do your will in this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.